Fred, when uh, we talk about long term, um, some people think uh, in terms of uh, a five-year business plan. Um, when you talk about long term of the universe, you're talking in the trillions of years, multiple trillions of years. Uh, I'd like to understand the, uh, it's, it's such a, a, a stunning achievement to be able to uh, hear in barely a hundred years of, of modern astrophysics and cosmology of being able to look trillions of years in the future. You, you do that. How do you do that and what do you see? Well, the reason why we can do that is that um, in physics we have built a pretty good understanding of the laws of physics, and in astrophysics we've built a pretty good understanding of the equations that describe the expansion of the universe, the equations that describe stellar structure, even um, the equations that describe the dynamics and structures of galaxies. So the key to the answer to your question is that we actually have equations to solve which have been tested and they tell us how our universe came to be at some level. They tell us how our universe operates. We understand how stars operate, how galaxy dynamics operates, how the cosmological expansion operates. We don't know everything, but we know a lot about yeah. those how things. How many equations do you need to be able to do that? Many, many. It, 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 that's, sort of an, <laughs> that's sort of an ambiguous question <laughs> because what do you count as a separate yeah. equation and right, stuff? Right. But the, 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 there, are, there are very many. But the point is we actually have a theoretical framework mm. and it's been tested and it works. And because of that, we can just project into the future using that framework, and that allows us to make sensible predictions for what will happen in the future of the universe. Well, now, when you say it works, how do you know it works? What do you test it against in the real world today so that you know it works so that you can project trillions of years in the future? Well, that's what all of astrophysics is trying to do for 100 years. So to summarize 100 years' worth of humanity's work in a minute, um, let me just give you one example. So. Take stars. Stars are governed by, in this case, four equations of stellar structure and three ancillary equations which define the opacity and equation of state and nuclear properties. Okay? So seven is the answer to okay. your question okay. for stars. Okay. And we can build a model that tells us what the structure of the sun is. Okay, so we can measure its luminosity, we can measure its size, we can measure its mass indirectly, um, and we can use those things to build a model of the star. Then we can see whether it works or not. Now you can see whether it works in two different ways. One is that if this whole story of nuclear reactions works, then the center of the sun should be producing neutrinos. We can see those neutrinos. Yeah. Now for a while, there was, we were only seeing half as many neutrinos as we thought, right. and we had to understand new physics, namely neutrino oscillations, to understand why we were seeing what we were seeing, but now we understand that, and it works pretty well. The neutrinos change in process. They change into different flavors of neutrinos, yeah. and it's a pretty cool thing. Yeah. The other thing that we can do is we can watch the sun vibrate. It has these oscillation modes. And the frequency of the oscillation modes and the spectrum of those oscillation modes depends very sensitively on the temperature and pressure and density structure of the sun, all the way, in some cases, deep down into the sun. And by doing those oscillation models based on the stellar model, and then doing the oscillation measurements, we can actually understand the, sun, the whole run of parameters of density, pressure, et cetera, in the sun to better than 1%. Yeah, amazing. Now, we don't know everything. There are some little wiggles that are still under study, but in the grand scheme of things, we understand stars. Now, we can also do this for whole stellar populations and on and on and on and on. But the theory of stellar structure is very well tested. So when we say that low mass stars will continue to burn for tens of trillions of years, even though we haven't been able to wait tens of trillions of years to test that, we're still on reasonably firm ground because every equation, every piece of physics that we use to make that projection has in fact been tested. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now from this, what do we see in the long evolution of the universe? Well, the first thing we see are that stars will last a long time. They'll last for tens of trillions of years. And those are the smaller ones. The, so the smaller ones our, last longer than the bigger ones. Our sun is a mainstream, a main sequence, a medium-sized yeah. star, would you say? Or? Our star's actually a little big. A little big, okay. Here, here's a fact for you. If you look at the nearest 50 stars, the sun is the closest, huh. where would you think its mass would be? Yeah, I mean, I, I would have thought somewhere in the middle. Or right, the, it's actually the fourth largest yeah, one. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. So our sun's actually a big star. Okay. And, and it's a big star at the 10% level. So. In very, very rough terms, 10% of the stars are bigger than the sun and 90% are smaller. Okay. Okay. So most of the stars are smaller than the sun, and the stars smaller than the sun will live longer than the sun. 
<laughs> Our sun will live another five, Six, seven? Yes. Five to seven billion years. So yeah. total, or very roughly, order of magnitude, 10 billion years. Okay. And the tenth of a solar mass star is the ones that are 10 times smaller live for 10 trillion years. That's a huge difference. It's yeah. a huge difference, right? Every factor of a thousand matters, right? Yeah. <laughs> and our universe is now only 13.7, 13.9 billion years old. So given that the stars will last for tens of trillions of years and the whole universe is only 14 billion years old, we're at a tenth of 1% of the way into our stelliferous era, the yeah. time when this universe will be bright and have starlight. Yeah. So for questions like life in the universe, at least there's hope we will have stellar power for much longer than we have existed thus far. So that that fact alone, statistically, is an odd number, isn't it? Don't you find that odd that here we are, in, in, and the universe is, is less than one tenth of one percent of its ultimate age? I mean, you have to be someplace. You I have mean. to be someplace, <laughs> and that's a one in a thousand event, right? Yeah, right. So, um, you know, how many people have yeah. you talked to before you married one? Yeah, yeah. Um, probably a thousand, right. but most people are married, or right. many are, right. so it, it depends on how many times you're at bat. Right, yeah. Okay, all right, so, he, so here we are. Uh, our star will last roughly 10 billion years. The small stars will last 10 trillion, trillion years, and, and then what? Well, after the stars burn out, um, there's actually two things that happen. One is that the stars that are existing will only last for tens of trillions of years, but the longest you could imagine the galaxy sustaining any kind of normal star formation is probably less than that, but maybe as long as trillions of years. So we'll continue to have some stars for trillions of years. And then in a logarithmic time sense, there's a fairly sharp transition beyond which we won't have very many stars. So then at that point, we have everything left over from stellar evolution. We have white dwarfs, because most stars will turn into white dwarfs. The big stars will blow up in supernovae and leave behind neutron stars, and some stellar mass black holes. And then, for every star, or every four stars, there's a brown dwarf in our universe, mm. or in our galaxy. Mm. So there's a bunch of stars that are not quite stars that we call brown dwarfs, so just little balls of hydrogen that aren't big enough to burn. They'll still be there. Now, the reason why that's important is that when the universe is that old, after the stars burn out, these brown dwarfs will have unburned hydrogen and they'll collide with each other. Rare, now the, but, rare but non-zero. Yeah. So we know the collision rate, we know how many they are, oh. we know how fast they're going. When they collide, they generally form a little star that will last for a trillion years. Oh. So if you put all those numbers together, you could say, well, how bright will the galaxy be? Right now we have billions and billions of stars, right? In this dark future after the stellar burnout transition, the dark galaxies of the future will have one or two stars. Oh, wow. Now, in addition to the brown dwarfs colliding and sometimes producing a star, um, or generally producing a star, the white dwarfs will also collide. Now, most of the white dwarfs will actually be low-mass white dwarfs, because most of the stars are low-mass stars. And when two sufficiently low-mass white dwarfs collide, you just get a funny white dwarf. <laughs> but when the large white dwarfs collide, and the product, the merger product, is over the Chandrasekhar mass, then the thing blows up. Yeah. You get a supernova. <laughs> so this dark galaxy of the future will be punctuated by these spectacular supernova <laughs> explosions, but they'll be very rare. And ultimately? And well, it, well it, this, this we, continues. So the brown dwarfs and the white dwarfs will not only collide with each other, but they'll scatter off of each other. So some of the um, stars, which are stellar remnants, will get thrown up to larger orbits and eventually evaporated into intergalactic space. The dark matter can annihilate can annihilate inside the white dwarfs in principle and also with itself. So after 10 to the 20-something years, the stars will have dynamically relaxed and the dark matter will have annihilated and we have a very, very diffuse universe. Now the stars that are mostly by themselves now will undergo proton decay. And as their protons decay, the stars themselves will basically evaporate into oblivion. Now at that point, the only thing that's left will be the black holes. So round about 10 to the 40 years from now, the black holes will inherit the universe. <laughs> and they will continue to um, power the universe through Hawking evaporation until the largest black holes have evaporated. And that will continue until the universe is about 10 to the 100 years. And then we're kind of out of business.